Hello YouTube, today I'm reviewing the Kizen program and uh, it's supposed to be 16 weeks. Uh, I only have access to four weeks, so I presume that the others you should be paying to get them. I wouldn't have reviewed 16 weeks anyway, usually when you have that type of program with a lot of, you know, exercise selection rotation, it's usually not very well thought out. There's no way that everything is put in order to achieve a certain goal. It's just exercises that are going to align with movement pattern specificity. So four weeks is enough of a sample for me to actually make a correct assessment on the program. And uh, from what I know, it was created by Silent Mike, uh, Kwan and Omar Izov, which also exemplifies that these guys are complete weebs because they named the program Kizen. I don't know what Kizen means. It sounds Japanese to me. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take the four weeks, I'm going to skim through it, and I'm going to see what is good and what isn't. Because I cannot review every single week within the context of the entire program because I don't have it. One and two, as I explained, it most likely won't matter. It's the days that matter more. And as far as what the program is supposed to do for you, it's a power building program, which I have my issues with the term power building. Because I do think that it was used for nefarious uh, pursuits back in the days when it was first introduced. But I do think that what it is, what it ends up representing is pretty much what everyone does. Because powerlifting is a, a powerlifting, sorry, power building is a mix of hypertrophy and strength. And bodybuilders are power, power builders and powerlifters are power builders too, because you will have to have a mix of both in your training, of course. The issue I have with the term also is that you can't be good at both. You have certain anomalies, certain guys who manage to be extremely good at powerlifting and bodybuilding, but usually the practice of powerlifting, because you are supposed to be good at the big three, is not going to encourage the development of a balanced and aesthetically pleasing physique. And you can see that with top level powerlifters who usually are they're big, don't get me wrong, they're massive, but they don't look good in the sense that they're not aesthetic, but they're just massively muscular. And on the flip side, you have bodybuilders who are not even one third as strong as they are, who look better. It's different pursuits, which is why if you're into power building, all the more power to you, but understand that you're chasing two different goals and that you're making it much harder to be really good at one or the other. The program, the Kizen program promises six training sessions per week, which is good, it's high frequency. So I'm expecting to see not as much volume, right? It focus, uh, focuses on the big three, of course. It has variations of the big three. All good, I do that as well. And it has separate days for accessories and supersets, which you're going to see that that is going to be an issue. I haven't looked yet uh, on dues, but I can tell you it's going to create some problems when it comes to volume and intensity. So the first four weeks, and it's called strength and aesthetics so it's not a power lifting program it's both it's for hypertrophy also so day if i am not mistaken week one day one it starts with a bunch of supersets so you're going to be doing shoulder press superseted with wide grip pull downs you superset a bunch of cable rows tricep push downs uh, dumbbell french press hammer curl and this is what i just said so this is a day that is going to have zero strength work and that it's just going to focus on hypertrophy. That's not good. Why? You need strength work every single day, most of the time. It's okay to take a day off strength work once in a while, but strength work is the pillar of the training. And I've explained it before. I might make a video dedicated to it. You want it to open the training for a multitude of reasons. And here, I sort of get the sense that it was a bunch of powerlifters who were like, okay, we're going to have a bodybuilding program. What is bodybuilding? Oh, I forgot to, I forgot about the light. Come on, light. All right. I'll be back. Aha. And just like that, the light is fixed. So it feels like that. It feels like it's a bunch of, of, uh, Powerlifters were trying to like think 
how do bodybuilders think? Let's do a bodybuilding day. But you can't think like that. You can't separate the values of strength and size if you want to build and encourage them in lifters. So that's my issue because this is going to be a lot of fluff. There's not much strength work. I don't see any compound movements in that day. And it's an issue. Why? Because it's still a day. And it's a day that is going to be recovered from no matter what happens. So you're going to recover from a bunch of isolation movements. And in my opinion, you're wasting recovery abilities. That's what I think. As far as the supersets go, supersetting a vertical press with a vertical pull, good. I love it. It's specific. It's synergistic. I don't have an issue with that. Cable rows and tricep pushdowns, they don't really go hand in hand at all. But why not? Lateral raises on top of that, that's... <laughs> that's three muscle groups that don't work uh, together at all. Uh, it's a superset, so I guess if you want to promote pr uh, performance, why not? But supersets are not supposed to be where you perform. That's also the issue. And a French press and an armor curl is actually much better because you get the long head of the tricep and the bicep, and you'll see that those two muscles actually work pretty well together. Uh, but it's even the, apl the application of the supersets, this is a bro application of supersets. You can't have a day where you just do supersets. It's a waste of time. So I already have an issue with that, especially when it's like, this is just the, the start. This is the day one. And then day two, and that's what I feared. Day two is squat, bench, stiff leg deadlift. So three lifts, compound movements that have nothing to do with one another. That is going to require a new warm up phase for each lift, pretty much, which don't scratch the pretty much it will because you're squatting then benching so your lower body gets cold and then you do a lower body lift again it's three sets of 10 reps it's at a low percentage so because it's it's easing you into, into the program which i made a video about it uh, in the hypertrophy series i don't have an issue with that per se for bodybuilders no point you don't need to fluctuate the intensity like this your intensity should be low if you're getting used to a lift but if I'm thinking within the realm of a bodybuilding program, you should be used to the squat bench and stiff like deadlift. So why are you trying to start with low intensity? It's a waste of tonnage. And as far as the, the lifts goes, I mean, you see the issue here, right? One day where you just do a bunch, bunch of isolation for 12 reps, and then another day where you only do compounds. This is not balanced. This is not how you program. This is like... You, you entering the gym and one day you have a bodybuilder cap on your head and the other day you have a power, like powerlifter cap on your head. doesn't work like that. You need both values. So yeah, I don't have much to say about that day. It's a strange day. Uh, it, it resembles a novice program. Squat, bench and stiff leg deads on the same day. It's like day one is a bad bodybuilding novice program from the start of YouTube and day two is a bad novice program from now, basically. Day three, let's see if they continue. So day three is, again, a bunch of supersets, uh, close grip pull downs, skull crushers, ch chest supported rows, one arm, like basically, okay. They basically, they went on T-Nation, they looked at all of the variations of the list and they just put all of the stuff in there. I don't even, it doesn't even look like they tried to be synergistic. There is no, it's just two sets for eight reps. It's eight reps, so it's not even an evolving rep range. It was the same for day one, by the way. 12 reps for two reps for two sets. So you're, you're sandbagging yourself on the first set. What's the point of that? I don't get it. Uh, you know, it, isolation movements are good, but having a day with only isolation is a waste of time. As I said, your body has the ability to recover from a lot but the smaller muscles that you have don't. So they should, be they should be trained more frequently with less volume. And they sort of do that because they never really try and tackle the same body part twice. So you'll never see usually two times an exercise for the long head of the triceps. But it's not a good thing. In this case, it's not because it's a bunch of isolations and you feel like they want to cover the entire body in sort of like a full body session. But compound movements exist for that so that you get a bunch of diffuse tonnage. I think this is misguided effort. 
day four, squat, close grip bench, incline bench, overhead press. So this might actually be the best day yet. Because even though the squat and the bench have nothing to do with one another, at least the bench, the horizontal and vertical presses follow one another, so you'll still be warm. And you open with strength work. You do three sets of five reps, so it's a three by five. Three by five is probably one of the one of the best of the worst static rep ranges, which means it's one of the best static rep ranges. It's actually great, especially on something like a bench. Um, after that, incline bench, if you like them, the incline bench and the overhead press are sort of redundant because they're both vertical presses, even though one is an hybrid. So a better day would be squat, close grip bench, overhead press. I think that the overhead press would be my choice of lift personally. And that would be much better. Uh, it's still not optimal. It's still too powerlifting-y where you only do compounds, but it's, it's better than nothing. Day five. Still off week one, by the way. It's still week one. Bunch of supersets again. Um, at least this time, there are, are, if I'm not mistaken, chin-ups. So at least they are making you do some vertical pulls with your body weight. That's good. But then, you know, they make you do chin up and within the same superset, you do cable, cable curls. So what do you do after the cable curls? You rest, but you, your bicep will still be tired, which is okay on the chin up, I guess, because you use mostly your back. The first superset is barbell rows with rope tricep push down, which no synergy again. The barbell row is two sets of 15, which is a great rep range for the barbell row. But see, I'm going to say it right now because I, I think the rest of the program is going to be like this. This resembles the type of program that would actually work on someone who just went from a novice program that only focused on compounds. Because once you enter this, one, it's going to feel like freedom because the days focused on compounds are much more eclectic in terms of rep ranges. So it doesn't feel as as asphyxiating. There's not as much repetition of the, the big three until you puke. And you get days where you just do bro stuff. You get days where you don't have to squat or deadlift heavy. You just do a bunch of stuff that gives you a pump and you feel good. And because those people are usually never uh, the, the, the type to isolate their muscles because novice programs shun isolation movements and shun one third or at least two thirds of the movement patterns out there. There are muscles that never tasted that type of training before. So they'll actually get results. You take someone who's never done any curls or tricep extensions or behind the head tricep extensions, they're going to see gains from this. Their arms are going to grow. Does that mean that the program is good or the application of the volume and intensity for the arm portion of the training is good? No. But if you've never done anything, even if you do something poorly, it's still going to create results. And I think that's where this program came from, right? I think that's the mentality behind the program. Day six, day six is a monster of a day. You do squat, post squat, bench, deadlift, <laughs> hamstring curl, and then planks. That's too much. That is too much. That is the mentality of novice programs who promote strength, who just throw everything at the trainee and are like, you do every movement pattern. That's too much. Squat and post squat, you're already going to be cooked and then they, may, they have you do deadlift. By the way, when it comes to lower back fatigue, this is, this is how you get injured. You start with a movement that is going to put a lot of actual, actual loading on the lower back. And then you have the trainee do a pull from the floor that requires tightness in the lower back to be able to develop the strength within the, leg, the legs. This is not good. And uh, even though the intensities are low, the, the, intent, the prevention of the injury should be promoted by the low intensity. But then you ask yourself, why am I wasting my time doing a bunch of reps on the squat that don't even challenge me? It's wasted time to me. And you might say, well, the program picks up. It's 16 weeks. That's already one week wasted, in my, in my opinion. We'll see if the intensity ramps up, but I really am not for that, especially because if you recuperate people after a novice program, they know squats and deadlifts. They know them. You don't have to reteach that, that to them. 
If you want to apply low intensity to certain lifts, you should do that to variations that they might have never touched, like the stiff leg at the day one, at the day two was okay, but for the rest, you don't need to do that. But of course, if you don't do that and you actually push the lifters to failure on that type of day with four whole compound movements that are going to be most of the time treated as strength work, there would be some problem. And, and I'm, I keep on going because there's always a, an option that I haven't spoken about, but it's, it's still bad. Even if you only train one in a strength work fashion, let's say the squat because it opens the day. Okay, that's fine. So the post squats are going to be a back off knee flexion, which I do, great. Then you do bench and deadlifts. So you're going to lower the intensity of these two and they're going to serve as sort of back off sets, additional volume for hip hinges and horizontal presses, which I get, but wouldn't it be better to just give them their own day? Because from what I see, all of what is packed in that day six could have been put around and redistributed in day five, day three, and day two. It takes me five seconds to rearrange all of that. You take the bench, you put it where you do a bunch of isolation movement for the upper, uh, the upper body. You take the deadlift, you put it where you do a bunch of isolation movement for the upper back. And just like that, you have a program that actually makes some sense. Instead of packing everything in categories for powerlifting or bodybuilding, it's best to mix them. So the exercise selection is not terrible, but I do tell you, if you want to follow the Kizen program, you need to make your own cake out of the ingredients they gave you. Because if you, if you follow the day, you're not going to get the full benefits of the mix of strength and hypertrophy. Week two. So week two is a repetition. Basically, it's going to be very similar with the same weird supersets. Day one doesn't even change from what I see, so it's still bad. Day two now, there's deficit deadlifts when before day two was actually squat bench and stiff legs. Here it's deficit deads, squat bench and stiff legs. Great, another, uh, <laughs> another compound movement added to the soup of compound movements. Why would you do two variations of the deadlift on the same day? I have no idea. I don't see the point. You should stick to one and promote the progression on it. And if you want to do it more on another day, you, you program it on another day. With the bench in, me, in the middle of all of that, it makes no sense. So again, strange. Uh, day three is the same mix of supersets for two sets of eight reps. And I didn't speak about that enough, but especially for a higher rep ranges, you really need and want to have evolving rep ranges set. Because you realize that the more reps you do, the more the ability to go back to baseline is going to be shoddy, the more you're going to actually benefit in terms of progression from being able to either push past or actually refrain from pushing past. So if you want to do eight reps, that's fine. Let's do five to eight reps. For two sets, that's a little bit too big of a range, six to eight reps. That would be actually much better because it, it would promote higher intensity while still being like firmly manageable and it will promote progression. Day four, squat, cross grip, incline bench, overhead press, I already discussed that. And then again, day five is just the same supersets again. They have you do chin-ups, two sets of 15 reps. I'm going to be a bit of an hypocrite because I personally won't do that. But I think that if you can hit 15 reps on the chin-ups, body weight, you should progress to weighted pull-ups. I personally won't do it, even if I get, can get to 15 reps. But for most people, it will be better because it would become strength work and it would facilitate progression. Unless you can progress from 15 to 30 or 40 reps body weight, which maybe it's possible, I've never tried that, but I'm not so sure. There's a reason why people do weighted pull-ups at some point. And then the last day is the same. Squat, post squat, bench, deadlift, I already explained, it's no good. And you finish with armstring curls and glute arm raises, which is always funny. Why not just put, uh, take the deadlifts out? And I think, and anyone who does both on the same day can vouch for me, when you do squats and post squats on the same day, your armstrings the next day are cooked. You don't need to do isolation. So, and I, again, I don't get it. And you, they also have you do planks at the end. That's very cute. Which planks, it's going to be bracing of the abs. It's going to be an isometric hold. You already do that when you do compound movements. I really promote, if you want to do ab isolation, do them 
in a stretching fashion. Do leg raises, do laying leg raises, stuff that is going to stretch the abs. The best ab hypertrophy exercise is crunches on an incline bench. Straight up, if I had the place in that garage, I would have one. I don't. Uh, and again, keep in mind that the intensity is still super low. So that's a program that is going to make you waste your time in the first few weeks, and it's no good. Why? Because when you train, you want the difficulty to be always there because that's what triggers progress. And the mindset of starting the, the training easy, to me, represents the deload issue that I've already discussed in the video. Bodybuilding is going to be, and the, the, the pursuit of uh, hypertrophy, is going to be something that does not require deloads because the deloads are programmed within the volume and intensity of the session. You don't need to rest for a week at 20% intensity. So this is a waste of time because if you compound the intensities at the end of the 16 weeks, we're already on week two. Yeah, maybe the last weeks are high intensity, but you wasted your time with low intensity stuff. And why? What are you trying to recover from? You should have trained at 70s, 80% intensity. It would be more taxing, but let's say your recovery is this, okay? This would be too much, okay? But this is also too low because you're wasting all of that. All of that recovery goes nowhere because your body doesn't have to recover from anything. So that's a waste. You want to match the recovery ability of the body throughout the sessions. And week three is going to be the same thing, same supersets I already desc described. If I see anything that changes, I will say it, but I don't see any change. The intensity are, are finally raising above 70%. And as I expected, they are at 70% for every single lift. So when I see a 75%, for example, for the cross grip bench, the inclined bench matches, which you understand becomes a problem because intensity artificially elevates as you get fatigued, especially on the same movement pattern. So that's a mismanagement of intensity. I don't see it in other days, for example, for deficit deadlift squats, there's different intensities. But again, if you have, I see here, stiff leg deadlift, 45%. 45%. What is the point of that set? It's just junk volume, straight up. When you do a movement, and that's my opinion, it should always be in relevant intensity windows. If you are not able to have that movement take place in a relevant intensity window, it means that you are not able to go back to baseline, which means you achieved muscular fatigue, which means it's time to go home because the muscle is tired. You don't have the recovery abilities or rather the endurance, the muscular endurance to keep hitting it, go home. And as I said, yes, uh, intensity artificially increases as you go uh, deeper and deeper within the session. That being said, I hope, I think, that when I see 45% here, it's what I call an inflated intensity number. Unless they base that off of the one rep max, which is potentially now much more, you know, applicable, because maybe it's not going to be a through 45% anymore because the trainee is going to be tired. So he's actually going to go to failure on this, but it's tough to predict that. It's, it's, I said tough, it's impossible to predict that, which means that most of the time they're going to just guess. They're going to guess that this set is actually going to be challenging. It's an issue. You can't guess. And uh, intensities are easy to, once you understand who you are, intensity are easy to, to uh, program. You don't need to guess. So as I, now I'm just checking the intensities because the rest, the rest is the same. <laughs> I also see, and I, I'm offended, I also see that they're not applying the intensity principles for their isolation movements, which to me confirms what I thought. It's just, they just said, oh, do, do bodybuilder stuff, put a day for bodybuilders, superset like cables and stuff. I, you can apply intensity windows to everything and if you want to progress on the isolation movements and if you want bigger arms, you need to apply the intensity windows to them as well. Just because you don't move as much weight, just because they're not the bench squat and deadlift, doesn't mean that you need to snub them like this because if you do that, you'll never progress on them. This is why those people, and I'm not saying the people who created the program, but in general, the type of people who train like this, their arms never grow and they wonder why. This is why, because you don't progress on them. 
So the intensities, as I, as I said, they progress, they progress. Sometimes they match, sometimes they don't. And that's that. Uh, that's four weeks, and I'm pretty sure the rest of the weeks are like that with just the intensity raising. So, again, I've never really seen a power building program I was a fan of, and this is why I explained it uh, perfectly. If you have other power building programs that you want reviewed, let me know. I will. I do not recommend this program if you want to get bigger. It can potentially be used as a bridge if you've never done isolation before, but even then there are better ways to do that and I've described them in the NH playlist. So any comments about Kizen, any experience that you might have, let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching.